Welcome to Talking Business. I'm Lerat Umdele in Johannesburg. And today we're asking why it is that the bigger, richer African economies are in serious economic decline. Experts say there's a variety of reasons, from the fall in the global oil price to rising unemployment to weaker currencies to poor planning. We're going to take a snapshot of these countries. Here's a look. Once Africa's ruling economy, South Africa is now ranked third. The reasons range from a fall in commodity prices to a weak currency and political turmoil inside the country. Capital is fleeing the nation. And in the past, Angola sold oil cheaply to China in exchange for loans and trade deals. Ghana consistently performs well in World Bank rankings. However, there are many short-term risks and inflation is high. Mozambique relies heavily on donor support, but in April, the International Monetary Fund suspended aid after revelations that the government had hidden its debts. That has cast a cloud over the economy. So that's just an overview of what's going on in some of the wealthier African nations. But really, what's at the heart of the problem. To debate this issue with us, we're joined by Tebe Igalafeng. He's the chairperson of Brand Leadership and Brand Africa. He's worked extensively with African governments, helping them with their marketing campaigns. And he's also known on the continent as a marketing guru, having helped many corporates with strategies in entering the African market. Seated next to him is Yvonne Mwango. She's the economist for Sub-Saharan Africa at Renaissance Capital. She handles a lot of policy around or issues around policy making on the economic front for her clients dealing with African economies. And finally, we have Ronak Gopaldis, who's the head of country risk at Rand Merchant Bank. And he too does extensive research on politics, economics, and security issues on the African continent. I appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. Tebe, let's start with you quickly. What's happening to these African economies? Well, I think it's clear and consistent policies and most importantly implementation. So there's a lack of implementation of the big ideas. Yvonne, what's happening? I think the growth path we've seen on the continent has been interrupted by the falling commodity prices and that's hurt in particular the oil exporters of the region. So we're in a situation where several countries are trying to reform and diversify uh, uh, their economies away from commodities so they don't return to uh, such a scenario. Ronak? I think it comes down to two things. Uh, bad luck, the external environment that you can really do nothing about, and then own goals. So clumsy policy mistakes have combined to put pressure on these economies when the external environment is already not in their favor. So essentially those two factors. In Nigeria, we had the election last year. In the build-up to that, there was political uncertainty. The election went well. You know, there was a sense of euphoria, a lot of goodwill. And instead of rolling that and taking advantage of that, uh, what we got was political uncertainty. We had to wait six months for a cabinet. We had to wait for uh, clarity around the fiscal uh, position, who the Minister of Finance was. So more questions and answers coming out of Nigeria. And that really put pressure on the policy environment. We had a, a trust deficit. Uh, there were question marks around policy credibility. Um, so really, it made a bad situation uh, far worse. Yvonne, I know you work extensively on Nigerian issues as well, and we've recently heard of airlines that are pulling out of Nigeria, a pullback on the stock exchange. Investors are really concerned. How bad is the situation? Absolutely. I mean, um, any investor will be concerned if they put money into a country and they're not able to take it out when they need to, be, uh, to and that's the situation Nigeria faces. Uh, Nigeria, like a uh, Quite a few other oil exporters in the countries are in a position where the FX reserves have declined substantially and they're forced to ration it uh, when people come asking for FX. All right, dollar shortages. It's not quite South Africa's problem, Teba uh, Ekalafeng, but what we've seen in this country is steady economic decline since 2012. In fact, some people are saying on average South Africa's economy has declined by 7% in the last five years alone. Well, I mean, uh, if you look at this, if you look at the South African economy, obviously started with great promise in 1994. But since 1994, we've had three different type of policies. We're starting uh, with, Man with Mandela's RDP to Mbeki's gear to Zuma's NDP. So what you are, and, and what you're finding is that there's a lack, uh, and it's probably across the continent. There's a lack of consistency and building on two previous uh, previous ideas and policies, where every new government that comes in comes in with a new idea. And what that does is. Uh, 
It also reduces trust in the economy, reduces trust in, in the leadership. Uh, what you need and what you uh, what you need to succeed uh, as an economy, but particularly here in South Africa as well, is the clear uh, clear policies consistent and implementation of those policies and that is not unfortunately happening here we are not creating jobs uh, the uh, poverty is, uh, uh, the, the, the gaps between the rich and the poor uh, is widening and uh, and and that's really what you're beginning to see and that's why you see a lot of civil unrest uh, all those are really the the fallouts are for, are from from uh, some of the policy decisions uh, that we've made Ronak how much of the problems in South Africa are economic how much of the problem is political I don't think in Africa you can divorce the two. Uh, the politics and the economics are interrelated. But I think, you know, the policy on goal story, sticking with that, we fi f fired our finance minister in December. That created a huge uh, sell-off in the markets, and it shattered confidence. And with, um, you know, the commodity prices doing what they were doing, uh, sentiment was the one thing that we could have controlled, and uh, we, we really um, didn't do that very well. Uh, similarly, in Zambia, the policy flip-flop in the mining arena around the VAT rules, around the currency um, regime, uh, you know, really also damaged sentiment. And I think it's a consistent theme that we're seeing across um, countries on the continent. What investors are looking for at the current juncture is clear, coherent policy, which gives them certainty around um, what parameters are going to govern their investment decisions. Let's move on to the third largest economy, Angola. Mm. The positive news is unlike South Africa and Nigeria, they're not in contraction. They're in slowed growth. Mm -hmm. Growing at 3.5% it's expected this year, but there's a real cash crunch in that economy. Besides the problems around the oil sector, what else is wrong there? Um, I think the main re uh, reason we're seeing uh, Angola being a hard hit in this time is the fact that the economy is quite exposed to the oil sector. So um, we can't divorce that from the current economic environment. And similarly to Nigeria, they're facing a situation um, where their FX income has declined substantially um, and it's res uh, resulted in uh, liquidity problems in the FX market. So if you're an, a multilateral uh, player in Angola, you are unable to repatriate um, um, all the money that you'd like to. So that that unfortunately has impinged on the growth outlook. We are seeing a slowdown. It's not yet at recession mode as Nigeria is at, um, but they are facing significant problems, which hopefully the IMF will help them iron out. So this, is, this is a problem with being a mono economy. The fact that you, know, you, you have undiversified revenue streams, uh, narrow tax bases, so it, it really exposes your, your uh, susceptibility to boom and bust scenarios. Uh, and that's something that is starkly illustrated by the Angolan example. I want to focus on the others. I'll put them in a group. Ghana, Zambia, Mozambique. Once upon a time, these were the star performers of the IMF. Everybody held them up as the examples to emulate in Africa. And now things have gone dramatically wrong. You've worked with the Ghanaian government. What do you think is the problem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you're right. You know, those countries are at one stage. We, we're just talking three, four years ago. Uh, they were among the six uh, fastest growing economies in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, by, as, as economists uh, are predicted, that we should be seeing uh, incredible wealth and prosperity out of those countries. But I think uh, some of the uh, decisions, uh, uh, discussions uh, that have been uh, are brought forward is uh, certainly uh, the expectations about uh, about oil uh, that didn't come to fruition in, in countries like uh, certainly uh, like Ghana uh, and issues about energy. So energy has been a, a, a major crippling uh, factor in the in those countries. Uh, and another one has been the reliance on the state. Uh, you know, if you look at a, a country, for example, uh, like Ghana, with a massive um, uh, a salary bill, uh, as you look at much of the uh, income that goes to the to the government, most of it goes towards paying. So, uh, uh, civil servants. So if, if most of your money goes towards uh, uh, sustaining salaries uh, and you're not creating industries and you are not uh, investing in the economy, it's going to be very difficult to sustain. I think one of the problems or, or reasons we're seeing um, uh, Mozambiques and Zambias and Ghana is uh, governance. I think there's been significant governance issues um, in all three economies whereby the authorities um, um, have not stuck to targets at themselves um, uh, set. We can't dislocate this conversation from issues of leadership and so when we come back in a short while we'll be asking that question what can the leaders do to fix it? Stay with us. Now we've obviously analyzed what's at the heart of the problem in some of these large African economies but Ronak what do we do to fix it? Well I think 
you know, there's a, there's a saying, never waste a good crisis. And I think um, we're starting to see in many economies that that's starting to take root. Uh, in South Africa, for the first time in a long time, we've seen business, labor, and government coming together um, to try to a sovereign credit downgrade. We saw the success of the renewable project in South Africa post-2008. In Zambia now, given their dependency on hydroelectric power, they're turning to solar energy. So we're starting to see some green shoots of, of reform momentum and progress. Um, but I think ultimately what we need to focus on is inclusive growth. You know, post... Um, global financial crisis, people were seduced by this Africa rising narrative, but this has been exposed as being unstable growth, unequal growth, and unsustainable growth. And I think now we need to focus on the quality of growth and the diversity and diversification of sources of growth. A lot said there. In your views though, Yvonne, what can be done to fix this? I think this environment will force a lot of countries to reform and we're beginning to see uh, the beginnings of it. So a country like Nigeria, for instance, which is a predominantly oil exporter, over 95% of exports are due to oil, 65% of its fiscal revenue is due to oil, they definitely need to turn around that particular economy. And the one area they're seeking to do so is diversify by investing in infrastructure in particular to allow other uh, sectors of the economy to flourish, in particular manufacturing, and also to support the services sector. As you know, Nigeria has probably got one of the biggest power deficits on the continent. And uh, if um, they invest more in that particular sector, make it cheaper uh, to access electricity, you would see uh, small business uh, flourish as a result. To be fair to Nigeria, 95% of their exports may be oil, but the growth of the economy is due to things like real estate, banking, even Nollywood. Similar story with South Africa. What needs to be done to kind of, you know, skew the economy more in favor of these new areas of activity? Firstly, you need to save the gains from your commodity sector during the good times and reinvest that in other parts of the economy. I think that's where a lot of commodity exporters failed. So as you're aware, Nigeria did have an excess crude account, which has now been depleted. Uh, they talked about setting up a sovereign wealth fund uh, following the initial injection. Nothing else was put into that particular fund. So we saw a little reinvestment of the windfalls uh, from uh, um, uh, the oil sector. And uh, that's one way in which you can help um, develop other parts of the economy. We've lost a lot of jobs uh, in the textile uh, and environment. We've lost a lot of jobs in mining, of course, in, in, in our uh, area. So what South Africa needs to do now is we really need to rethink. So I think one of the, uh, one of the, one of the ideas that we can applaud of government, I guess, is, is this new uh, uh, policy to create 100 industrialists uh, uh, in three years. I do think the time is a bit unrealistic, but at least the idea and the focus of, of, of noting that industrialization is key is important. I've heard experts say actually many African leaders are not bold enough. They should be going for growth rates of 10, 15 percent, not 4, 5 percent. Do it the Chinese way is what I've often heard being said. Again, focus on quality of growth, right? So we have this obsession with the number GDP growth. The reality is you can't eat that. You Correct. need to create jobs. This is the urgent challenge of our time. And a focus on soft infrastructure, things like healthcare, like education, which are going to mean that the, our young urbanizing population gets jobs so that they can save, they can, they can spend, they can produce uh, and become economically active. Uh, and that's what's really going to catalyze this virtuous circle of, of growth in Africa. Um, so I think we need to focus on qual quality of growth rather than quantity of growth because that's going to be more sustainable. If there's one thing we can also learn from the Chinese is, uh, is this benevolent protectionism. So somehow we need to protect our economies, particularly our nascent economies, and, 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 and nurture some of these young entrepreneurs in Africa who are coming up with new ideas. But the one other thing I think we should also look at is if you look at across the continent, we are investing at 0.9% or 0.6% uh, in research. So if, we on, if you're not investing in research, it means we're not creating, we're not investing in innovation. If you look at our uh, World, world Intellectual Property Organization, <laughs> of all the intellectual trademarks registered worldwide, Africa accounts only for about 1%. So we are not creating new ideas. Uh, if we're not creating new ideas, we're not creating new products, new services, we're not creating jobs, we're not creating growth. If countries are not saving, or when they save, then they spend. In this case, some are even accused of stealing the money. Herein lies a big problem, accountability. Yes, um, and that's been a problem across the continent. If you look at, uh, you mentioned the likes of Mozambique, Zambia and Ghana, it's the fiscal area where the problem has been. But um, you asked how 
some of these problems could be fixed. We talked about reforms and so on, and you mentioned accountability. It's voting out governments that you feel are not um, um, uh, managing the fiscal or, or basically governing correctly. And we saw that in the case of Nigeria a year ago. And uh, we've, have, we've had the Buhari administration come in with a very strong anti-graft stance um, and trying to recover some of the assets that were stolen under previous administrations. Um, simply because they, in this environment they need those resources to reinvest in the economy. It also speaks to the need for strong institutions, um, you know, a strong revenue authority, strong courts, strong, strong debt management offices are critical uh, because regardless of what political party comes into the fray, uh, what their agenda is, the fact that is that if institutions work, uh, you'll be okay at the end of the day. Final question to you all, Tebe. Businesses are wondering, should we still be investing in Africa and are we going to get good returns under these circumstances? Where else will you be going? Mm -hmm. Because if they go to the rest of Europe, you know, as I say, the rest of Europe and the rest of the West has got a past. Africa has got a future. We've got incredible arable land. Uh, and if you look at this, uh, if, if you look at the opportunity in agriculture, just in Africa only, so the opportunities are here. We've got 70% uh, of, the, of the population under the age of 30. We've got the youth dividend. So if we invest in the right ideas, we've got the labor to be able to do that. So this continent is growing. So all the other countries that are in, in the rest of the world you're talking about, they're all going to be growing at zero to, uh, to two percent. The rest of the continent is growing at uh, three to five percent. And that will continue when we make the right policy decisions and we, we ensure that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that everybody is accountable in, in, in the countries that we put in power. We are the future. Everybody should be in Africa. Um, I'd like to highlight on his one point, the youth. Um, if you look at the median age for several of our countries on, in the region, I think it's in the high teens. We're the youngest population in the world. Uh, that alone makes it attractive, not just as a source of labor, cheap labor that is, but also a potential uh, consumer um, population going forward. Uh, so it remains an attractive story. We'd like to think of this period we're going through as an interruption to the Africa rising story. I'm an Afro-optimist, so I think um, Africa is definitely the continent of the future. And investors really need to go and look back at what their original investment thesis was. All of those factors still remain in play. The de demographics, the rates of urbanization, mobile penetration, uh, the fact that Africans are underbanked, uh, the fact that you know, we are going to see, we need to industrialize the opportunities in infrastructure, in telecoms. All of that still remains, remains in play. Um, the Africa rising story is punctuated, it's paused, it hasn't stopped. I think what I, what I would like to say about this Africa rising story is we need to ensure something that as Africa is rising, the pilots are African. Thank you so much, Tewe Galafeng, Yvonne Moango, and Romac uh, Golpaldis. I'm Lerat Mbele. This is Talking Business from Johannesburg, South Africa. Thank you for watching.